Hello everyone, I hope you are watching this safely at home. We'll try to conclude the chapter on inventory management today, despite the unusual circumstances. And I will also uh, say a few words about how we'll organize the, the exam as well as your project. So this is the plan for today. I'll talk about the remaining chapters in this course, as well as the assignment that you'll get at the end. And we'll try to see how to organize projects and the final exam. So we have two remaining variants of the economic order quantity model to see. They are called the reorder point and quantity discount models. So before we see that, I'll also make a little um, summary of what we have seen so far. And then the last part of this course will be about the Sampran case, which you can find on e-learning. It's called the inventory management case. All right, so first thing first, uh, we have two remaining chapters in this course. We need to first finish uh, the chapter on inventory management, and we have two remaining uh, models to see. These are the reorder point model, as I've said, and the quantity discount model. And then the last chapter will be called aggregate planning. It's chapter 11. Uh, that chapter wouldn't be that important, to be honest, compared to the rest of what we have seen since the midterm. So you can expect that the bulk of the exam, the final exam, will be about chapters going from statistical process control to inventory management included. And since we have reorganized the, the final exam, it will be online. Uh, I'll say a few words about this in a moment. In any case, uh, to reduce the influence that this exam will have on your final score, I've decided to assign an exercise, a case study, that will account for 5% of your total score at the end of this chapter. So it will be obviously about inventory management. You will have one week to turn it in. It will be due by the 24th March, and I have created a folder on e-learning in which you can upload your work. As for the final exam, well, it will take place on the planned date and time, which is supposed to be on the 1st April from 6 to 8 p.m. So that didn't change. The only thing that changed is that the exam would be online. So at the beginning of uh, the scheduled time at 6 p.m. on the 1st April, I'll upload the questions of the exam on e-learning, and then you can upload your uh, answers which will be on a Word document, the same Word document uh, as the questions, on e-learning by 8 p.m. on the 1st April. And now the final exam will only represent 25% of your total score. Now there is one remaining open question that I would like to open a, a dialogue with you about, and that's your fi final project. So you have had a few weeks to work on these projects so far, but I'm sure that with the lockdown and the current circumstances, you won't have opportunities to meet your uh, teammates, you won't have uh, the ability to go visit businesses, etc. So please let me know by email individually, or uh, at least uh, team by team. Let me know if you're having difficulties with your projects or if you would still would like to turn in your work, if you have advanced before um, the change of plan, if you have uh, some material, some data that you think are enough to turn in a project. The alternatives we can consider are to either count your work as usual if you have, say, 80% advancement in concluding your project, or we can also cancel it simply for some teams and in that case, I would just count the rest of your grades as the remaining 20% that the project was supposed to represent. Okay, so on to talk about inventory management again. Uh, what we have seen so far is the definition of inventory and the type of throughput that we manage in this chapter. We have seen that this could be of one of three forms, raw material, work in progress inventory, or finished goods. And then there's a fourth form that we don't really cover in this chapter that is outside the scope of inventory management models because we manage it with different types of models and these are what we call maintenance, repair and operating inventory. So this is outside our scope. 
we have also seen why inventory is strategic. Simply put, it's because uh, most of the cycle time, also known as flow time or throughput time, is spent in a state of waiting, right? It's a, it, it, um, a form of inventory that would represent an input that is wasted in waiting. So any improvement we can make to this, any reduction we can make to the 95% on average cycle time that is wasted on inventory would be an improvement in terms of efficiency in production. Inventory is evil. That's the simple way in which we put the paradox in managing inventory. On the one hand, we want inventory to be as high as possible because it provides safety and supply and it keeps customers happy. On the other, Inventory is costly, risky. We have seen that most of the quality defects appear during storage. Um, so on the other hand, we also, want to, we also want to reduce our amount of inventory in order to have a high turnover. And so the models we see in this chapter are about finding the balance, the optimal balance between these two conflicting objectives. We have seen the toy example of a beer vendor on Kaosan Road that shows you that inventory management is a concern for any business of any scale, of any size. And we have recalled some of the indicators and metrics that we defined in chapter on supply chain management. Those were the percentage of assets committed to inventory, inventory turnover, and the number of weeks of supply. And these really capture the paradoxical nature of inventory management in that we want one thing and its opposite to be both as high as possible. On the one hand, we want a high turnover. And on the other, we also want a high number of weeks of supply. And so the best way to manage this type of uh, balance, to, to find this trade-off between these two conflicting aspects, is to state the problem mathematically. So this is what inventory management models do. They define two types of costs. One cost, the holding cost, that would be proportional to the number of units we hold in inventory. And on the other hand, we have the ordering cost that only depend on the number of orders we make in a year. Now, since we will assume demand to be constant, which means that we are going to order the same quantity annually anyway, you have one cost, the holding cost, that increases as the size of our order increases. And on the other hand, the ordering cost is going to decrease when we increase the size of our orders. Since we order more per order, the number of orders we make in a year will be lesser. Formally, we define the holding cost as the, as the cost per unit that we pay to hold or carry one unit of inventory for the whole year. As for the ordering cost, it's defined as a cost per unit as well, but here the units are the orders. So we pay this cost S, because the ordering cost is also known as the setup cost, we pay this cost every time we order. And so the objective of any inventory management model is to minimize the total cost of inventory management. Here, note that we are not including the cost of the items we are ordering. It's simply about finding the strategy, the ordering quantity that would minimize the cost of holding it and the cost of ordering. And so for this, we have made six assumptions. In mathematics, we speak of simplifying assumptions. When you take a complex reality, in this case, inventory management, and you make some assumptions that simplify it in order for it to be representable with numbers, with a model. So these are the six assumptions on which rests the economic order quantity model, which we have called the basic model of inventory management. That's because all other models will be this same model in which we are going to relax or remove some of the assumptions we make. So the six assumptions we have made are first, that demand is known, constant, and independent. This is quite big from what we know about uh, forecasting demand. But the thing is that here we're assuming that the difficulty of forecasting demand, the certainty we have in demand, is guaranteed by the forecasting models. So we don't deal with two difficulties at the same time. Here we are just dealing with the, the difficulty of inventory management. Second assumption is that lead time is known and constant. What is lead time? We have explained it. It's simply the delay between the moment you make the order and the moment you receive it. 
there could be some days of delay, of waiting, uh, and this number of days can be uncertain. As we have said, for a supply chain that is as efficient as the supply chain of Amazon, they still tell you that you'll receive your orders in two to three days, right? This is uncertainty. Well, here in our second assumption, we are assuming that this uncertainty does not exist. Third assumption, and this one, in fact, makes lead time zero. In the third assumption, we are assuming that we receive our orders immediately. Receipt or inventory is instantaneous and complete. This is, again, quite unrealistic, but as we have seen, the model is nevertheless quite robust. Fourth assumption, here we assume that quantity discounts are not possible. So it's not possible to decrease the price of the product of the items we are ordering by ordering more. When in fact, quantity discounts are a very important mechanism in all supply chains. It's uh, almost the rule that the price of the items is a variable that depends on your order quantity. So here, for now, we are not dealing with this difficulty. We'll see later how to adjust the model to deal with quantity discounts if they are present. Fifth assumption, we assume that the only costs that matter for inventory management are the two costs we have defined previously, which are the holding cost and the ordering cost, meaning that there are no hidden or indirect costs. And then sixth and last assumption, we assume that we cannot turn down orders. In other words, that shortage is not an option. So we assume that it's possible to avoid a shortage and it's all about uh, finding the way to do so with our inventory strategy. And so if we accept these six assumptions, we have seen that we can represent the behavior of our inventory management with this chart, the triangles. Each triangle represents a cycle of ordering. So we start with our order quantity that we have called Q, and then our inventory declines uniformly at a constant rate. That's because of our first assumption, which is that demand is constant. So any day would have the same demand as any other day. And then a new cycle begins as soon as we order. And you see that the receipt of inventory is instantaneous. So our inventory goes immediately from zero to Q, our order quantity. Here, there is no lag, no waiting time. And so under this model that we call the economic order quantity model, we have established the optimal quantity to order, which is the quantity that minimizes the total cost function. This total cost function, as per one of our assumptions about cost, is the sum of the ordering cost plus the holding cost. So we have expressed the ordering cost as S, the ordering cost per unit, times the number of orders, the number of orders being D, annual demand, divided by Q, the size of our orders. As for the, the holding cost or carrying cost, that would be H, a holding cost per unit held for a year. But as we have seen, there are no units, no actual units or inventory that will be held for the whole year. We can only speak of an average, and we have established that with the economic order quantity model, with the triangles that we have represented as the behavior of our inventory model, well, we get an average inventory uh, level of Q divided by 2. On average, we hold the size of our orders divided by 2. So if we represent the total cost function graphically, we get the red line, which is a shallow U function, as we have seen. And we have found that the point that minimizes this function, the optimal order quantity Q star, is given by the formula square root of 2ds divided by h. We have established this formula by solving the equation that makes the total holding cost equal to the total ordering cost. And so note this equation very clearly. It will be useful for the remainder of this chapter. Q star, the economic order quantity, is the square root of 2ds divided by h. We have seen an example of the basic economic order quantity model with um, this example of a clinic that stocks needles. We have uh, an annual demand of 1,000 units, so we need 1,000 units, 1,000 needles per year. It costs $10 per order. This is the ordering cost, S, and it costs 50 cents to stock one needle for the whole year. 
With this data, we have found that the optimal quantity to order, the economic order quantity, was the square root of 2ds divided by h, which gave us 200 units. Another thing we have seen is that the economic order quantity model is what we call a robust model. What does it mean? Well, it means that despite the six simplifying assumptions that we have made that may seem unrealistic, the results that we get with the economic order quantity uh, model are not too far from what the optimal results would be if we had complete knowledge, complete and perfect knowledge of all the parameters of the model. For instance, one big assumption we have made is that demand is known with certainty. We know this to be untrue from the chapter on forecasting. Well, suppose that we have misestimated demand by 50% and it turns out to be 1500 units instead of 1000 in the previous example with the needles. Even with this 50% error, which results in 22.5% uh, error in uh, Q star in the economic order quantity, so we have wrong results, the consequences in terms of cost, the opportunity cost of this error, is not that um, significant because of the shape of the total cost function. As we have seen, this shape is a shallow U function. And so even if your Q star is quite far from what the optimal Q star should be, the impact on cost is not that significant. This means that the economic order quantity model is forgiving of simplifying assumptions. We can afford to make simplifying assumptions, even if they result in a 50% error in forecasting demand, which itself results in 22.5% difference between the optimal order quantity and what we have gotten with our wrong estimate of demand, the impact in terms of cost is really minimal. It is absorbed by the, the shape of the total cost function, which is again a shallow U function. Summary of uh, the economic order quantity model. The first new model we see today is called the reorder point model. In each new model, we are going to remove one assumption from the six assumptions we have made in the, the economic order quantity model. And that would give us a slightly more complex and slightly more realistic model, depending on the circumstances. So in some cases, it may be important to consider that uh, the third assumption we have made is not that realistic. I recall the third assumption. It was that receipt or inventory is instantaneous. So if it's not the case, and if there is some delay that we call lead time, then we should use the reorder point model. So this is the only difference between the real point model and the economic order quantity model, it said there is lead time. We denote this lead time L, so it's a certain number of days that we have to wait before receiving our inventory. Now, when we consider lead time L, this is not going to change how much we order. The economic order quantity still stands. We are still going to order an optimal quantity of Q star equals the square root of uh, 2ds divided by h as we have found earlier. But the fact that there is lead time, given our sixth assumption, which was that we cannot turn down orders, meaning that we cannot have a shortage. If we have to wait L days to receive our orders, this means that we are simply going to order L days earlier. So the only change compared to the, the economic order quantity model in its basic form is that the, the answer to the question of when should we order is going to be different. In the economic order quantity model, we order when our inventory reaches zero, as we have seen. If you remember the graph with the cycles, the triangles, we only place an order when inventory reaches zero. Well, in the reorder points model, we're going to order L days before our inventory reaches zero. So the change between the basic economic order quantity model and this new model that we call the reorder point model is simply that we're going to place our order L days, which is lead time earlier than in the basic EOQ model. Why? Well, because since we cannot turn down orders, we cannot have a shortage, we're going to order L days earlier so that as soon as we receive our order, our inventory reaches zero and we can start a new cycle. So with this change, we need to calculate what we call the reorder point of our inventory model. What is the reorder point? It's the point in inventory at which we're going to make the order. 
So the real order point is not the point in time because the point in time is L days before we run out of inventory, but a point in inventory. It would be the minimum level of inventory at which we should get the signal that a new order should be made. So what is this reorder point? Well, very logically, if you have to wait L days of lead time to receive your order and you consume your inventory at a constant rate, you will order whenever you have just enough inventory to wait for L days. And so in the reorder point model, there's going to be a need to define daily demand. Why? So that we know how many units of inventory we need to be able to wait for L days. Given the, the annual demand uppercase D that we have defined previously, and our assumption that demand is constant, so that any day has the same demand as any other day, well, daily demand that we denote lowercase d would simply be annual demand, uppercase d, divided by the number of days in a year. So if we have this daily demand, lowercase d, our real point, which is the minimum level of inventory at which we should make a new order, is going to be d times l, lowercase d times l. So this means that as soon as our inventory reaches this level, the real order point, d times l, a new order will be made. In the previous example, the first clinic example that we have seen where we order needles, we have found that the economic order quantity or optimal quantity to order was 200 units. This came from the square root of 2ds divided by hatch. Now, what if we don't receive our orders immediately, but we have to wait two days for them to be delivered? What would that change? It's not going to change our order quantity. It's still going to be 200 units, but it will change the point in time at which we make our order. It will change the reorder point of our model. That is the minimum level of inventory at which a new order will be made. And so to calculate this minimum point that we call the reorder point, using our previous formula, D times L, if we have a thousand units of annual demand, as we have seen in the first example, so annual demand uppercase D is 1000 units and there are 250 days in a year. We would have a daily demand of 1000 divided by 250, which is four units per day. And so if you have to wait two days to receive your orders and you consume four units per day, our real order point is going to be D lowercase D times L four times two and we get eight. So this means that our real order point will be eight, not zero. But if we want to question another one of our assumptions, which was that annual demand as well as lead time are certain. That's another big one, another slightly unrealistic thing to assume. So what if we want to remove this? Well, we can very simply do it by assuming that there is a worst case and best case scenario for either lowercase d or L for daily demand or for uh, lead time. Let's assume, for instance, that there is uncertainty about lead time. Just like the supply chain of Amazon, what if lead time is not certain to be two days, but we are told that we have to wait, for instance, two to three days. That's going to change the formula for real point. If lead time is two to three days, we are still going to use the real point formula, which, has, which says D times L should be our real point. But here we'll consider a best case scenario where L is at its lowest, that is two days. So with L at its lowest, we get a real point D times L of eight, as we have seen previously. And then a worst case scenario, if we take the longest possible lead time of three days, that would give us a different real point of D times this worst case L which would be four times three, 12 units. The difference between the best case and worst case lead time, which results in a best case and worst case real order point, as we have seen eight and 12 units, is what we call the safety stock. So the difference between 12 and eight is four. We're going to have four units of safety stock what is safety stock? These are simply a certain number of units of inventory that we keep on the side just in case lead time is at its worst. Just in case lead time takes 
three days to um, be exhausted. So if we have to wait three days to receive our orders, we can rely on our safety stock of four units. But our real point will be based on the best case scenario of just two days of lead time, which gives us a real point of eight. So we'll order whenever our inventory reaches eight, but we will keep safety stock of four units at all times, just in case, again, lead time takes three days. The second variant of the economic order quantity model is called the quantity discount model. We are going to remove another one of our assumptions, which is assumption number four, the fact that quantity discounts are not possible. Now we are going to assume that quantity discounts are possible indeed. So what are quantity discounts? In retail, it's for instance, when you buy three pizzas and get one for free. This means that the price of one product decreases as you increase your order quantity. In supply chains, these me mechanisms, the quantity discounts, are almost a rule. You find them in all supply chains. The price of the items you order is never constant. It's always dependent on the quantities you order. And so the quantity discounts are typically expressed with these tables that we call a quantity discount schedules that give you the price per unit as a function of the quantity ordered. For instance, in this example, we have a basic price of $100 per unit for small quantities defined as quantities between 1 and 1,999 units. And then the price drops by $10 as we increase the quantity. So between 2,000 and 3,999, the price per unit would be $90. $80 for quantities from 4,000 to 5,999, etc. We call this a quantity discount schedule. Now, the presence of quantity discounts is going to make one major difference in our inventory management model, in the basic economic order quantity model. This difference is that if there are quantity discounts, the holding cost, hatch, is not going to be a constant anymore. Instead, hatch will be a variable expressed as a certain percentage i of the price of the items, which is itself a variable. So to repeat, the price of the items depends on the quantity we order, the quantity Q. And the quantity Q, if we express the economic order quantity formula square root of 2ds divided by hatch, when hatch is not a constant, but a percentage i, a given percentage of the price of the items P, the quantity we order will also depend on the price of the item. So you see there is a double reference here where the quantity we order depends on the price of the item and the price of the item depends on the quantity we order. So we need to break this deadlock somehow. And this is what the method I'm going to describe does. To solve this double reference where Q depends on P, the price of the item, and P depends on Q based on the table we have seen previously, the quantity discount schedule. We have a method in a certain number of steps that's, that's going to operate by trial and error. Hmm. Is that except for hatch, the holding cost, everything else remains the same. The only change that the quantity discount model does is that hatch becomes I, a certain percentage, times P. And so if we express the economic order quantity formula square root of 2ds divided by i times p. Now, we solve the double reference problem that I have mentioned previously with these steps. We are first going to consider the best possible price in our quantity discount schedule, the cheapest possible price. So we take this price. Once we set the price, there is no double reference because now we know p, so we can know i times p, and we can calculate q star. But it doesn't stop here. We need to check that the price we have considered, the lowest possible price, does indeed give us access to the quantity we have found, Q star. So we're going to check that the quantity we got, Q star, corresponds to the price we have considered, that there is a match between the cheapest possible price and this quantity. If there is no match, we need to forget about this price. We will never have access to it with the quantity we have gotten. So. If there is no match, we look at the next best price. And we're going to repeat the same process with this second cheapest price. Once we set it, we know i times p. 
we can calculate Q star as the square root of 2ds divided by i times p. And we check again that there is a match between this price that we have considered and the quantity that we find, Q star. Uh -huh. Match, we are going to note all the prices for which the Q star we get corresponds to the price we have considered in the quantity discount schedule, the table that describes the quantity discount mechanism. And then we are going to use the total cost as a criterion to decide on our um, order quantity on Q star. We'll simply pick the pair of price and order quantity that would give the lowest total cost. Here is an example. For this example, which is described at length in your lecture notes, we are managing a stock of remote control drones for which there is an annual demand of 5,200 units. The ordering cost is $200 per order, but you see that the price of the items uh, is subject to a quantity discount schedule given in the table, where the initial price for quantities from 0 to 199 units is $100. This price drops by two units, by $2 to $98 for quantities from 200 to 1,499 units. And then the price drops by $2 again to $96 for quantities of 1,500 and over. This means that the holding cost of these items is going to be a percentage of the price of the items themselves. Why? If you remember, part of the holding cost included some form of insurance against damage done to the items. So as part of the cost of holding or carrying inventory, there is the, the opportunity cost of any damage or theft or obsolescence that may happen to this inventory. So it's logical that the more expensive the items, the more valuable the items, the higher the cost of holding them. This is the idea of a holding cost that is uh, proportional to the cost of the items. Now, having said all this, hatch is not a constant anymore in this model. Hatch is going to be a percentage i of the price of the items. This i is given in this example to be 28%, but what is not set yet is the price of the items. We don't know the price of the items yet. So if we express hatch as i times p, a percentage i of 28% of the price of the items, you can see in the, the Excel screenshot here, the little table, that for the different prices in the quantity discount schedule, 198 and $96, we get different holding costs of 28, 27.44 and $26.88. So with this, once we set the price, we can calculate our economic order quantity, Q star, which is always the square root of 2ds divided by hatch. We get different order quantities, as you see, 272.55, 275.32, and 278.17, corresponding to the three prices in our quantity discount schedule. Now, which quantity should we go for? As I've previously described in the method in two steps, we choose the quantity for which there is a match between the price and the economic order quantity Q star, starting with the best possible price, the cheapest possible price, which is $96. We need to double check that this, this $96, this advantageous price, does give us access to the quantity we have found, Q star, according to the quantity discount schedule. What does this mean? Well, for our result here, $96, as you see, gives us an economic order quantity Q star of $278.17, uh, $278.17 units, sorry. So we need to double check that this quantity of $278.17 corresponds to the price of 96 in the quantity discount schedule. So if I go back to the quantity discount schedule, I see that the price of $96 is only possible for order quantities of $1,500, $1,500 and over. This means that there is no match between our price of 96 and the Q star we have found of 278.17. So we need to 
discard this price of 96 would have liked to get access to it of course it's the cheapest price but it's not possible according to this strategy so we need to look at the next best price which is 98 again with a price of 98 we can set hatch we find hatch to be uh, 27.44 dollars with this we can calculate q star square root of 2ds divided by hatch we find 275.32 and again, we double check with the quantity discount schedule that the price of 98 does correspond to the quantity of 275.32. So in the quantity discount schedule, we see that $98 is possible for quantities from 200 to 1,499 units. So indeed, there is a match here between our price and the, the economic order quantity we find. So we note this price and economic order quantity and we look at the next price, which is $100. Again, for $100, we find a Q star of 272.55. But in the quantity discount schedule, the table, we see that $100 is only for quantities from 0 to 199. So again, there is no match here between the price we have considered and the Q star we find. This is indicated with the red color for prices that do not match the Q star they result in. And so according to our method, the only match is between $98 and 275.32 uh, units. So that should be our strategy. In this problem, the optimal solution would be to order 275.32 units per cycle for a price of $98. And this concludes this very unusual lecture. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send me emails or contact me through Sky. Um, I will leave you, as I've said, with an assignment that you can find on e-learning. It's a Word document called Inventory Case Study, so give it a good read. Take your time to solve it. The first few questions are qualitative, so try to get a good understanding of the in-depth description that is given of the problem. We really try to put you in a situation with this problem. So try to imagine that you are the consultant described in the problem and use what you have seen in this chapter to answer the qualitative questions. As for the quantitative part, it will be an application of this model, the quantity discount model, to a case where we are stocking on um, uh, industrial refrigerators parts. So try to understand the context and then just apply the model as we have seen with this example. Again, you can contact me if you have any questions. Uh, and please let me know also by email uh, if you think the solution I've proposed for the exam works for you, if there are any difficulties with uh, your projects. So let's try to, to get uh, a dialogue going by email. You have my email. I don't have yours. So that would be also an opportunity for me to, to have a list of your email addresses. Okay. All right. Stay safe and talk to you soon.